So let's go to antispasmodics. Bill, can you, well, anybody on yeah, the panel? So uh, this is what I would say, is that um, there is evidence to suggest that antispasmodics can help with abdominal pain. Um, but my own personal preference is to use it in patients with postprandial abdominal pain. And, and the reason for that is because uh, the traditional antispasmodics are anticholinergics, and the gastrocolonic reflex, which is hyperactive in IBSD patients, for example, and associated with the development of pain, is at least partially cholinergically mediated. So it makes sense to use an anticholinergic in that s a setting. What I, what I would also say, though, is that it doesn't make sense, any sense to me, to use anticholinergics for chronic abdominal pain. I can't envision a reason why that would work. Uh, and I would discourage people from doing that. But PRN use for postprandial abdominal pain? Absolutely. Why not put everybody on titrating dose of Imodium, Brennan? Save money. Well, I think Imodium is, is good, um, you know, for slowing the bowel down. But it's uh, not at all clear that it affects the sensory experience of IBS. What I mean by that is, you know, we have to distinguish the sensory symptoms, pain, bloat, fullness, tightness, from the bowel symptoms. Uh, diarrhea, incontinence, constipation. And loperamide is perfectly good at changing the speed at which the colon moves, but it's not at all helpful for chronic abdominal pain. So bloating distension is one of the most common and most bothersome complaints in IBSD. So is that going to be in Rome 5? Yeah, you know, this is a complicated discussion. We, we, we certainly looked at that really carefully for, for Rome 3 and Rome 4. And the problem is, so here's the thing, is that virtually every patient with IBS has bloating. So the sensitivity is off the charts. The problem is the specificity, because if you look across the functional GI disorders, virtually all of them, the patient, a significant proportion of the patients have bloating. So the difficulty is in the specificity. That being said, I absolutely, 100% of the time in IBS patients, regardless of it's, whether it's part of the criteria or not, ask about bloating, because I, I completely agree with you. I think it's one of the most bothersome complaints for patients with IBS. All right, antidepressants. Well, Tony. So, um, yeah, th there's a lot of data on antidepressants, um, although most of the studies are small. Should we uh, be calling them antidepressants in this use? Well, they're visceral analgesics, is, is how I present it to patients. Or neuromodulators. Or neuromodulators. neuromodulators. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, neuromodulators. Uh, they're, they're neuromodulators. So that's how I present it uh, to patients. Right. And, uh, but I, un, I explain to them that it's in the class of antidepressants because, of course, they're going to see that when, when they uh, pick up the prescription. But I explain exactly how, you know, how, we, think that they, how we think they work, and, and I usually walk them through some of the data. And we tend to, you know, you oftentimes we'll use a low dose, like tricyclic antidepressant, where probably most of the data is, uh, particularly in patients that have IBS with diarrhea, because they do have an anticholinergic uh, effect. And I start the dose relatively low, and there's data suggesting that in people with IBS with diarrhea, that 10 milligrams of amitriptyline um, will, will be helpful. And then I will titrate the dose up, oftentimes going to 50. Uh, milligrams, and if they don't tolerate it, I would switch to, to one with a little less anticholinergic effect, like dezipramine would be another one, or nortriptyline, and, and uh, do that. And I will also sometimes, uh, in patients that have IBS with uh, constipation, the data is not as good for SSRIs um, and, and SNRIs, although we believe that, they're, that they are probably helpful, the SNRIs, for pain. But I will sometimes use those, those as well, and I'll also start low in the dose and gradually increase. Uh, with it. So I think there is a, a, a role for them. So I, I was at a talk recently and one of the speakers said that they combine an SNRI with mirtazapine. And my mind went like, I mean, where's the data for that? Um, that's not evidence-based medicine. So I guess there's a lot of experiential medicine here. Uh, and Brennan's probably the best expert on this panel to talk about evidence-based medicine. Obviously, we need more evidence. What's your thought on this? Yeah, I mean, area? there's evidence based and there's eminence based medicine, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, there's some use that. to I, both. Can of I use that? I didn't make that up. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, sometimes we don't have evidence for a lot of what we do, and it's worthwhile hearing from experts who have a large experience and can speak to it. But, you know, obviously, there's a fine line, and, and we need to try and wherever possible 
rely on the evidence that we have. I mean, when we talk about antidepressants or neuromodulators or however we want to discuss them, and I think it's an important distinction because I don't tell my patients, I tell them, listen, I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, I'm not here to manage uh, your mental health directly. That's not what I'm trained to do. But uh, it does look like the brain and the gut talk to each other. And in fact, this idea that the brain and the gut are sort of, or the brain and the body even, are separate and apart is a very old concept from the mid-1600s from Rene Descartes. And it still to this day you know, affects the way we think about the human body. But the, you know, the, the, the apparatus in our body, the sensory apparatus, the neuromuscular apparatus is all an extracranial extension of the brain that just happens to be in the skull up, up, up top to be protected because we're doing a lot of processing up there. But we need a body to, to, have, to know anything, literally to think. So there's a really fascinating neuroscience behind that. But when you kind of pose it that way, say, listen, we're, you know, I'm gonna try and modulate the way the two sides, the neurovisceral poles are communicating with each other. And there's pretty reasonable evidence that using neuromodulators can help both with the, um, with the pain and to some degree, when, when relevant, the visceral anxiety that goes along with it. But would you agree that most of these things are blunt tools still though? Oh yeah, absolutely blunt tools, but, um, but I totally agree with the, the approach Brennan just outlined, which I really think if you explain to patients this interaction between the brain in your head and the brain in your gut, uh, that they get that. And, and, and I, I also completely have changed to really talk about neuromodulators rather than antidepressants. And I, th I think um, it's, it's really important to because it helps the patient to understand that you're not giving them uh, the medication for its antidepressant properties. By the way, I, would, I also think it's important to tell the patients that when they go to the pharmacy, I prepare them for the fact that a lot of times a pharmacist will tell them, oh, oh I see your doctor started you on an antidepressant, which can be quite upsetting to people. So uh, it's good to just prep them for that, that possibility.